him. The Bible says we reign by one Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. So we bless you, Lord. We thank you that you're causing us to reign in this earth with you. Hallelujah. This song says he reigns. Can you say my God reigns? My God reigns. Our God reigns.
bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord, for being our King of kings and our Lord of lords. We thank you, Lord, for being our light and our salvation. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for being the lover of our soul, the keeper of our mind. We thank you that you called us out of dark places. Has he called anyone out of a dark place? Hallelujah. Has he delivered anyone? Hallelujah. Has he healed your body? Hallelujah. I know he set us free. Hallelujah. That's why we praise him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. This song says, I just want to praise you. Yes. I just want to lift my hands. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And say, I love you. Thank you, Jesus. It says, you are everything to me. Come on, let's sing it to the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to praise you. Let's sing it to him. Just want to praise you. I hands and say I love you. You are everything to me. And I Say we 
yourself in with the Lord as we go boldly to the throne of grace. He has invited us to do so. To beseech the God of all might, all power, all knowledge. The God who has promised never ever to leave us nor to forsake us. The God that is able to do more than we can even ask or think if you think about that that's a lot we have some vivid imaginations so Father God we just come to you right now in the name of Jesus the song they sang said that you reign over our circumstances and God there's lots of circumstances in our lives God some are facing unemployment. Some are dealing with issues, brokenness in the families. Some are dealing with loss of family members and loved ones. God, some are looking at our children and wondering how we, your sons and daughters, could have children that sometimes don't honor you at all, God. But yet, God, we look to you, God, because we know that you are able. There is nothing that is impossible with you, almighty God. So I beseech you today, God, to touch God, to restore hope today, God, to restore joy today, God, to restore peace today, God. We look to you, almighty God, and we magnify you, Lord God. We make you bigger. <laughs> than all of our problems and all of our circumstances and all of our situations. We make you bigger, Lord, because you are omnipotent God, indescribable God. We don't even have the words, Lord God. So we cry out and we beseech the Holy Spirit to help us to pray because we don't really know what to pray. We don't always know how to pray. We don't really know what the need is. Sometimes we just look at the surface things, God, but sometimes the need goes deeper. So we ask you, God, to just move, God, to heal, to deliver. Heal our brokenness, God. Grant unto us, God, a spirit of repentance, God. Grant unto us, God, a spirit of forgiveness, Grant unto us, God, the spirit of your love, God, a love that covers a multitude of sin, God. And then we ask you, Father God, that you would forgive us of our sin that we have committed, Lord God, by thought, word, and deed, almighty God. Cover us with the blood, the blood of Jesus that washes over us, and it washes over us, and it washes over us, Lord God. And we are made clean. And we are made whole. And we thank you, Father God, for all of your grace and mercy and your goodness, God. And I thank you for this family, God. I, I thank you, God, for our pastor and her absence, God. Continue to keep her, God. And I pray, God, as Brother Doug comes to bring the word, Lord God, that you would 
stir up our hearts, God, that you would break up any hardness, God, because sometimes, God, disappointment brings hardness. Disappointment brings bitterness. Disappointment brings unbelief. But, Lord God, we thank you that it does not change who you are. Now, unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or even think to him be all of the honor be all of the glory and be all of the praise in Jesus name amen thank you Jesus let's say it again say we exalt thee as a as a thank you to the Lord hallelujah And we exalt thee. And we exalt such a talented group of musicians with us. Amen. Give them a hand. We are so blessed. I want to thank Sister Phyllis for that powerful prayer because during the prayer she mentioned our youth and our children. And I'm happy to say here at South Bay we are providing a platform for our children. So if you have a youth or a child, we're going to take this time to excuse you to join Sister Ashley back there in the back. Wave your hand. So we want to make sure we at South Bay do what we can to give our children, our youth, the right direction. Amen. Amen. And we got some going this morning, too. I love it. We're also at this time going to acknowledge any first-time guests, any guests with us today. Raise your hand. No. Just the tried and true regulars. Amen. I love that. We're filling it up. We're also going to take a moment, as you know, and uh, with the green dot, we're going to love on each other, share a brief story, what's going on with us, and talk about how hot it is. I know y'all know it's hot out there. <laughs> I'm not the only one. So I'm going to ask you to take up some time and go and greet each other and say hello and hug and all those things that we love to do at South Bay. Amen. Go for it. All the love. Everybody missing each other. Happy to see each other. I know y'all want to keep hugging, and I appreciate it. And for those that are on Zoom, you're missing out in here. When you feel the need and you want to come on in, we're encouraging you to come on in. Amen? Folks, they are roaming, getting to their seats. I'm going to give you a moment to take your seats. Because at this time, we want to take a moment and show our appreciation for how God has blessed us by giving back to support all the things we do here at South Bay. Uh, we are so blessed to have the opportunity to get outside these walls to do things. And those things are possible because what you do to help us move it along. Amen. So we have the 
num numerous ways to give. We have the app. We have are the envelopes behind the chair. Is that they're there? Okay. And you can do snail mail. You can do the uh, Alexio. We you're not gonna tell us you can't give. We're gonna find a way to get you. Because God has blessed you. Amen. And you want to be able to turn that blessing around and share it and expand outside these walls. Amen. So I'm going to give you a moment to find those right applications to use to uh, give. I'm going to say a blessing. And then I'm going to encourage you to turn your attention to the screen for our announcements. Let us pray. Father God, we are just so grateful that you have blessed us with our health, with our finances, with our families, with our loved ones. And Father, we want to take a moment to just give back. We want to give back with an open heart, freely, willingly, and happy to give here at South Bay to help those that are not as fortunate as we are. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Hello, South Bay family. These are your highlights and announcements for the week. Calling all young adults. Join us for an exciting day of escape room fun at Cubic Escape on July 15th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Get ready to test your problem-solving skills and work together as a team to solve mind-bending puzzles and unravel mysteries. It's the perfect opportunity to bond with other young adults while having a great time. Grab your thinking caps and sign up on the church events page for this incredible experience, and we'll see you on Saturday. Let's get summer fit and have some fun. Summer exercise classes have kicked off, and the turnout and feedback have been incredible. So get up, get out, and move what the good Lord gave you. Spicing up your regular fitness routine with Zumba, yoga, or dancer size classes taking place here at the church. Classes are filling up fast, so head over to the Body, Mind, and Spirit Ministry page to see the class schedule for July and August and sign up for a Saturday morning session. As Christians, we must embody justice in all areas of life 
including political engagement. Are you ready to explore what it means to engage in discipleship formation and represent Christ through a faith-rooted lens? Register today and be part of this crucial conversation on Friday, July 28th and Saturday, July 29th, 2023. This conference is perfect for SBCC members as it aligns with our Advocating Justice tenant, the A in PEACE, and allows us to tackle pressing issues of injustice and discover how we can respond effectively. Visit the events page to see the entire Friday evening and Saturday morning schedule. SBCC will host a live satellite broadcast of the conference in the multi-purpose room. The conference fee is $25, which includes breakfast. To attend, register on the events page, head to the giving portal, and select special events as your option for payment. Don't miss this opportunity to be part of a movement for change. Let's stand together as the church, embodying justice for a better world. These are your highlights for the week. Amen. So before we bring, um, we have a speaker today, Doug Erickson is going to be bringing the word of God today. Uh, but before we do, we have a pre-sermon song. Um, and it's a beautiful hymn. I'm sure a lot of you may be familiar with it. We're going to put the uh, video on the screen. But we're going to ask if you could stand and um, participate. It is a congregational hymn. So we want to all be a part of that. So we can go ahead and start that. Good to be in the house of the Lord together. 
what a wonderful time we've been having so far. I couldn't help but being struck by the contrast between the interlude music that we got, which was really uplifting, and I couldn't keep my feet stop, and what we just sang. What we just sang had, has rich words to it, and in my heritage has been great, but the tone and the effect is a bit more subdued. <laughs> you see, you may not have noticed, but I'm Swedish. <laughs> and uh, Scandinavians are known for their flat affect. And our topic today is joy. <laughs> and my wife has been clear that uh, when I speak, I tend to be just monotone <laughs> and a little, little flat. So, uh, I hope you take that into account as you hear the, the proclamation of the word. It's all right. <laughs> the word joy is going to show up all the time. And recognize that I'm experiencing joy inside even if you can't see it, okay? Uh, we, we, <laughs> we, we all have different DNA, and we all express ourselves differently. And so this is about joy everlasting. And maybe a subtitle for this should be Joy and Sorrow, because life is so mixed, yeah. and, and we want to have joy, but even as we were singing about joy and expressing joy in our service today, we've been acknowledging, especially through the prayer that we have, that there are struggles, there are places that bring us down, that kind of mute our joy a little bit. So I guess... What I want to do today is have us accept those realities and then let joy be the thing that dominates, even if it doesn't wash out, okay? So uh, let's get going that way. Here's the big idea for the sermon. Despite sorrow, there is joy in the presence of the living God, which passes understanding. We don't grasp it. We don't understand it we experience it. It's just like peace. When you think about joy, what comes to your mind? I think about something that's wonderful, that's overwhelming, that's triumphant, that it's energizing, and it's beautiful to behold. It connects with the deepest yearnings of our heart. But sometimes it's elusive, not able to be grasped. And sometimes it's hard fought, and it takes a goodly while to have joy show up. Despite the barrage of negative news, joy is present all around us. What makes you smile? What brings you joy? How do you experience contentment and satisfaction? Consider these joyful uh, images. Brenda and I got married right here in this church, and there were all kinds of folks here of every different color, stripe, and background, and we had a great celebration, and that ripples on even as life goes on, but for those of you who are here and have seen us connect, joy is going on. Recently, the Denver Nuggets finally broke through the 47 years of struggle that they've had and won the NBA championship. And that long struggle burst forth into a great celebration of joy. The players, the managers, the city, and those of us who were basketball fans were just delighted that all that hard work and struggle resulted in that outcome. Well. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So keep your joy to yourself. <laughs> uh, the month that's been in front of us, the June, has had all, all kinds of other celebrations as well. Juneteenth is a fantastic celebration of, of freedom. In fact, some people have suggested that that celebration ought to continue right up to July 4th because that's, that encompasses who we are as a whole country, our struggles and our victories attempt to get where we want to be and the limitations of where we are. Father's Day wasn't too long ago either, and uh, 
my two daughters who are living in this area, and uh, the one daughter who has children, their grandkids joined us for a meal. And I experienced just an overwhelmingly great Father's Day. My two daughters expressed kindness and tenderness and some overcoming from struggles of the past. But even more exciting than that, my grandkids, when they arrived at the restaurant, and Bryn and I were sitting there, they rushed up to me. And they threw their arms around me and told me they, they loved me. And it was great. Amen. You ever think about joy when you uh, see a beautiful sunset? Or you listen to a great concert and the kind of music we've had this morning? Joy just uh, comes right through. When you have a job that's been well done, either by yourself or by somebody else who you take part in, or when there has been estranged relationships, but somehow God brings a break. Amen. We have joy with that. Amen. In our congregation, we've welcomed children back into uh, an active service that they're in right now. We've also had grandchildren be born, and there's a particular grandchild, and a couple of people in our congregation have just overflowed with us, and... Uh, Sometimes they're around, sometimes they're down south. Uh, but we've all shared in that. We also had the privilege of serving the Lord together. Yes. And that brings joy. Yes. We've done that in our Safe Parking Initiative. We do that in our har Hardy Harvest. Recently we're giving uh, stuff for the Pajaro folks. And it may have some work. It may be a little more flat on the surface. But underneath all that is the joy of giving, the joy of serving, the joy of obeying the Lord and doing what he wants for us. Amen. One of the greatest experiences that I've had in the midst of this congregation for joy is something that took a little while. And that is when Pastor Murphy left, as a congregation, <clears throat> we had to figure out what we're going to do for a lead pastor. And we went through a several months long process, maybe six or more, in which we evaluated what the requirements were in the scriptures, which we thought about what our congregation is like and what our needs were, what our surrounding community is like, like what, what kind of purpose we have, what our identity as a church is. We had different thoughts. We had a committee going on. We were listening to each other. We were praying. We aired all kinds of dynamics. And through the whole process, the Spirit of the Lord moved in our midst and brought us to the place of a common understanding. And in God's joyous way, he confirmed that Tammy should be our pastor. And we rejoice over that. And our joy continues as she leads us today. Well, the scriptures tell us to be joyful always. I ask you, is that even possible? Life seems to have its mixture, mixed dynamics with joy. At times, it floods in in abundance. At other times, <clears throat> The demands of life can squeeze it out. Family, work, church, even internal struggles can keep us and mute our praise. I've experienced being too tired or preoccupied, not fully present, even self consumed, and I miss the joy. Praise God that He knows and that he will do what he needs to to stir that back up in his own good time. When we sing praise songs, sometimes I'm right there, and my spirit is soaring. But other times, though I'm giving mental assent to the truth worship, 
I'm still flat and kind of unmoved here. Well, why do we have such mixed reaction? Let us recognize that joy is a gift from God via the Holy Spirit. We yearn for it, we want it, and the Lord in his own sovereign way gives it to us in measure, his own time, through life circumstances, but he gives it. And so I wanted to explore joy this morning to better understand it and to experience it more fully. I wonder, can joy be mixed with sorrow and still be joy? In our world, we often confuse joy with happiness. Happiness is generally associated with positive circumstances, with pleasant experiences. But it is as fleeting as the circumstances themselves are that brings the happiness. To be knocked over uh, with the next event that brings us a different circumstance. Joy, on the other hand, is a quality that can be ours even when life gives us a black eye or our money runs out or we are in a quandary over how to uh, cope with negative circumstances. Does joy equate to exuberance? Does it require excitement, enthusiasm, always being upbeat? But I'd like you to take a little journey with me. Imagine yourself in the following circumstances. Your wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. The two of you must decide which treatment you're going to undertake, either radiation alone or radiation and chemo. Following the surgery, you've got a month to make this decision, so you decide to go on some R&R at your favorite vacation place. And you're settled in there after a few days, not quite clear which decision to go with. In the middle of your sleep, the phone rings, and you're awakened by your daughter, who tells you that your son has been in a horrible car accident. That he was hit with a drunk driver through an intersection. Guy was driving 100 miles an hour. And she says, fortunately, they were real close to the trauma center, and the ambulance got him here right away. And he's having surgery right now, and the doctors give him a 50 50 chance of surviving the surgery. Your mind is flooded with fear, bewilderment, confusion, almost panic overwhelms you. Your whole body is trembling. How can this be? The whole context of the breast cancer decision is radically changed. Your younger two college-age children are with you, as well as your mother-in-law. And you know the Lord is with you as well. You know he is sovereign. He is good. He is loving. That nothing happens that God does not allow. That he holds the future. And that his providential love, mercy, and care have not been voided. Nevertheless, you are stunned to the core. You pray with all of your heart for the Lord to give the doctors wisdom. To protect your son and to find a way back home as soon as possible. In the middle of this crisis, you know the living God, who he is, his character, his ways, his promises. You know the biblical story. You know how he has revealed himself to Israel and through the Lord Jesus. You've seen all kinds of circumstances that the Bible teaches us about Places that joy wasn't present, but God had not abandoned, that he continued. So in your bewilderment, you remember these truths, and you trust him. 
Your prayers embrace that he is in charge. So you surrender to his care, not knowing what the future holds for your son, your wife, your family, or tomorrow, the next day, or the rest of your life. So where is the joy in this story? Is it washed out by all the uncertainty? Is it destroyed by the tragic circumstances? How can one have joy in the midst of such a trauma? Can we be... uh, Can we have joy when we experience all the cards being stacked against us? Do we have to uh, play the ostrich and bury our head in the proverbial sand? Must we respond with Pollyanna and naivete, expressing an unfailing optimistic outlook, blindly quoting Romans 8.28, that all things work together for the good, trying to reassure ourselves that everything's going to be okay. No, we don't have to ignore the facts. We don't have to hide ourselves from the truth or be a cockeyed optimist to experience the downside of life with joy. When we know God's word, we understand that in this world there's trouble galore. We also know that God's story doesn't end in tragedy. The Bible presents pictures, many pictures, of deferred resolution of troubles. The Israelites were slave in Egypt for 400 years. They wandered in the wilderness for 40. They were taken into captivity twice by the Assyrians and the Babylonians. At one point, they were captives for 70 years. In the midst of these circumstances, the prophet Habakkuk faces the reality. He understood economic collapse, food supplies drying up, all means of sustenance going away. Nevertheless, he knew that God would not ultimately abandon his people. He knew that in God's good timing, God would act to protect and sustain Israel. So he concludes with all this reality, even though, even though, even though, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. May we have such faith and affirmation ourselves. Though God's timing isn't ours, it is perfect. It was many centuries ago when the fall happened. And Jesus didn't come for long, long, long decades after that. But he came in the time that Galatians tells us was the fullness of time. The very opportune moment. He came to provide Salvation, even though that was delayed between the last prophet in the Old Testament and John the Baptist arriving, announcing the king has come, there were 400 years of status. And in our day, we have all kinds of things like that. And the Lord still is present. He's still doing what he's doing. But our ability to see and hear and know and have the confidence deep down in that in the end, joy is going to win, that the Lord is going to win, we we have to wait for his good timing. We have to wait patiently. But going back to the story I told you, where is the joy in that story? Well, let me tell you the rest of the story. This was a real-life experience that my wife and I at the time experienced. Our son, Stacy, 
when he was 30, had this horrible ordeal. He spent two weeks in the ICU, almost dying a couple times from respiratory problems. He spent another six weeks in the rehab center. Eventually, he regained his strength and all his faculties, praise God. Though he almost died in this horrible car accident, the Lord had other plans. We rejoice that he was uh, restored to full health. Today, you wouldn't know he'd been in this car accident apart from a large surgical scar down his chest, and he has a slight dent in his forehead. And oh, by the way, he no longer has a spleen. He can live without that. In the providence of God, many blessings came from this tragedy. Stacy met his future wife through his rehab. His personal faith was centered and anchored by these life-clarifying events. Today, we have four delightful grandkids growing in mind, body, and spirit. In the end, there is much cause for rejoicing as the years unfold. God's goodness, care, healing, protection continue even though for a time they were hidden from sight, like the sun behind the dark, stormy clouds. That was our experience. And, oh, by the way, my wife died 12 years later from her breast cancer. But again, four and a half years later, God gave me a wonderful gift when Brenda became my bride. That was for you, darling. <laughs> the reality is we're not alone in these experiences. Job had to endure horrible losses, loss of his family, his wealth, his health, and having comfort given to him by people who made him wonder where in the world is God and all these things. Joseph had similar dynamics where his brothers, out of jealousy, sold him to the passers-by, and they took him into Egypt. Eventually, he was cast into prison, and through dreams and the providence of God, he was raised to be at the right hand of Pharaoh, and he was used to overcome the famine that had been in the land and sustain his family from starvation. And the kicker is... That after these decades, he was even renewed in a relationship with his brother. And so over all this time, God's sovereignty remained. Yes. And joy was still present. And you all remember how Joseph responded. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Amen. Praise him. I think about other circumstances. And our own congregation, the life of Carl Ray, tells a similar story of struggle and yet the Lord's presence in his life. On a different plane, during World War II, there was a German theologian by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer who uh, resisted Nazis and uh, in his faithfulness, Hitler saw fit to throw him into a concentration camp. And about five days before he was liberated, he was killed. But Dietrich Bonhoeffer's impact continues on in his writings and stories and appreciation for his life. And perhaps your story also has this mixture of sorrow and joy, time awaiting and still yearning and wondering while the clouds hang on. Well, what is joy? It's more than happiness, that's clear. It's a quality that encompasses 
a deep appreciation of life. We value the creator and the creation. We appreciate beauty, order, and creativity in the world. We also celebrate relationships in all their wonderful diversity. Relationships between humans and relationship between us and God. And there's much to be joyous about there. It's a feeling of well-being. Such things as safety, contentment, companionship, fulfilling one's purpose. It's a sense of gladness when justice is achieved, when goodness prevails and the end is not unjust. It comes to us when hope is sustained, even when hope is hard to find, when we know that our future is secure because of the cross, we can sustain in gladness. When we receive guidance and the clouds part and we see the way clearly, God gives us joy. And when relationships are renewed, when we were estranged, but now we're reconciled. God's powerful hand is there, and joy, verse 4. And when we experience a job well done, when we have fulfilled our purpose, when we are doing what God calls us to do, there is a deep satisfaction, which may look, however it looks, to the individual person. It may be muted for me because of my DNA, but it could be exuberant, and it covers the whole range. But ultimately, joy is a gift, a gift from God, which comes from the Spirit. But I want to also affirm that joy is our future reality. Amen. We're going to experience joy that is uncapable. You can't put it back in the bottle. <laughs> it's going to just come on out. And when you read the scriptures, as I did in preparation for this, and kind of looked at every one of the places joy was mentioned, you know, it's just packed full of it. And all kinds of places are, when this happened and there was a struggle, but this other thing happened and something overcame it, joy burst forth. Amen. And then all the Psalms come in there, and they're often expressing tremendous joy about who God is yes. and what he's done. And the more they engage in that, the more joy comes forward. There are many things that serve as counterfeits for joy in our society. All these short-lived uh, victories, which have to break God's law to, to get there, thinking that something good has happened. Or when we seek pleasures without relating to God, or we place our hopes in things that don't satisfy, like wealth or success or popularity or fame. Fortunately, there's a joy that's greater than that. Next slide, please. So absorb this quote. Our experience of joy is directly related to how closely we know God, how much we live under his lordship, and whether we allow ourselves to be shaped by his presence in our lives. Let me uh, take you on another journey of life experiences that I've had, and I'll put it in terms of, have you ever had these experiences? You ever had a period in your life when everything felt like darkness during a storm? Your enthusiasm for life was drained. Perhaps you were deeply depressed. You might even have felt like you lost all the benefits of your salvation. Life itself was like a raging sea, tossing waves tossing you back and forth. The battering continues constantly. In your life, there is no peace. Nevertheless, amid the chaos at the surface, you have this profound sense that way at the bottom of the ocean, there were calm waters. 
Though you may not experience the calm, yet you knew it was there. Has God ever given you this uncanny awareness of his peace? The assurance that he was with you in the storm? That he had not abandoned you? He was still with you, even if you couldn't see or feel his presence. That's what joy is like. It is the reality of who God is. Next slide, please. So back to our central point. There is joy which can be known despite sorrow. Let's just remember that the Apostle Paul himself had that experience. He says in 2 Corinthians 6, that uh, we were ignored, yet well known. We lived close to death, yet we were still alive. We had been beaten, but we had not been killed. And then he says this, our hearts ache, but we always have joy. There it is, the two realities right alongside each other. But Paul affirms that joy is real, it's present, and it is can live in the midst of everything else. Peter also has affirmations that are similar. He talks about trials that come with our faith. But then he says, So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Though you don't see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your soul. Let's remind ourselves as well that Jesus experienced the same kind of mixture of joy and sorrow. He wept over Lazarus' death. He wept over Jerusalem as he was coming into the city, wanting to gather them to himself, but recognizing that they resisted, that they weren't willing to be brought under his protection. In the Olive Garden, before his uh, arrest and crucifixion, Jesus experienced great anguish as he asked the Father to take this cup from him. Nevertheless, he submitted to the Father's will. Luke tells us in this anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. On the cross, he also cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Indeed, Jesus was a man of sorrows. But that isn't the dominant element of his life. Hebrews 12 tells us that because of the joy that awaited Jesus, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. I have a hard time putting into words how to have those two things fit together. Here's Jesus obeying the Father, knowing he'd been called, knowing that he was sent for this purpose, knowing that he was going to fulfill his destiny to go to the cross. But he also knew the horror of that, what crucifixion was going to like, how it was going to tear his body apart, how, how he was going to go into a place where he would say, my God, my God, why are you forsaken? Yet he could see joy that was before him, on the other side of the cross, in the ultimate sense. And he was willing to live with both of those realities simultaneously and let joy give him energy to go forward and to do the right thing, to do what God had called him to do. Praise be to God that he did obey. And that he... Yeah, let's, let's give him a hand. The encouragement here in Hebrews 12 is that we too might experience that strengthening 
that joy can give us and sustain in the midst of difficulties that we might face. Let the Lord reassure you deeply and profoundly that he's with you, that he loves you, that he cares for you, that no matter what, in all the storms of life, God is there. And his personhood gives us joy. Even if it's so hidden that it's like going to the bottom of the sea. Just having an awareness, not having an experience of it. So let's just remember the breadth of what Scripture communicates. The joy is present at the very beginning, as we're told in, in the creation story, that everything is good. In fact, it was very good, and God was delighted. And uh, that's present for us at the foundation of life. In the final book, the end of the story, is also great joy. Especially when God sets aside every power that opposes him. In the end, there's a great celebration of joy forever. The bookends of God's story affirm joy and joy. And that's our reality and the ultimate reality. But in between, there's a mixture of joy and sorrow. We partook in that by choosing to go our own way. But God also had a choice. And he chose to keep on keeping on with us, pursuing us, providing for us, Amen. engaging Amen. us, revealing himself Amen. to us, helping call us back. He was going to bring the truth of himself to us. So resist as much as we did and may and even will. God in his great love and sovereign ways will show us himself. We will experience his joy today, tomorrow, and ultimately. The Bible says that uh, weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. You have turned my morning into joyous dancing. You have taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy. So, I got about four more pages here, but I think I'm basically done. (laughs) Let me just recap the essence, and that is that our joy is breaks through when we're intimately connected with God, with the living God, who lives in our midst and in the world around us and in our hearts, and he shows himself at all turns, even when Satan tries his best to hide that reality. And when we don't have a voice publicly, and when everything comes crashing in, that it's a horrible, horrible, no good world. That's only part of the story, and it's the minor key. The dominant story is that God is love, and God is joy, and God's in charge, and God will show himself. And the interim, he lets time take its way till he comes and shows himself. And we have the privilege of knowing this God, knowing him intimately, knowing the way he's in our lives. That's the joy of being part of this congregation together. We sing about it. We share about it. We experience it. It continues. Our joy is built on who God is. That he's good. That he's faithful. That he's creator. That he has mercy. That he's gracious. That he's sovereign. That he's never abandoned. 
What a glorious God. Let's remember the words of Scripture. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. What joy we experience when God reigns, when he reigns in our life today, and ultimately reigns over everything. Praise be to God. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to transition to communion now. Pastor Tammy isn't here, and uh, I'm not formally a pastor. I've never been ordained, and though I have done communion before, uh, it's not in my wheelhouse. But I would like to uh, just affirm the reality, and that is that this is the Lord's table. He is the one inviting us to sup with him, to take the sustenance that he gives through his body and his blood and let it fill us. Let it engage in all the cracks and crannies of our life where we need comfort, where we need joy to uh, burst forth. So what we're going to do is I'm going to invite the deacons to come up and they will, they will serve you. Each one will come and get the elements. And we'll wait until we all are prepared. And then we'll partake of it together. Um, the words of the elements. I had wanted to have the scripture up here, which is inviting us to the table. You're, you're familiar with it, and I don't want to be a deliverer of that, but I would like to have you read the words, meditate, and hear the Lord saying to you, come and eat. This is my body. This is my blood, which is broken for you. Do this as often as you gather in my name. Please come forward to receive the elements, and then we'll take the body and the blood together. Take of your body and your blood to let your joyous service flood us with joy. Take and eat. This is his body. Likewise, partake of his cleansing blood that was shed for the remission of our sins, that we might be made new, and that all the barriers between us and the God have been washed away. If we'll just come humbly and acknowledge our sins and receive him and repent and let him shape us day by day drink of his blood, which is life to us. Amen. Hear the benediction, which comes to us from Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace 
as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and enjoy him today. Amen.